Hope everyone's well. Welcome to another episode of Portal to the Paranormal podcast. We hope everyone is doing well. So as you can see, your host tonight, as always, it's me, Nando. And tonight we have... Sarah. So, you know, we hope, again, everyone is doing well. Tonight we have a great guest coming on with us. Um, So just a bit of an introduction, really. So we're going to welcome on in a moment, Paul Goddard. Um, He is a hypnotherapist and master practitioner of the new neuro, shall I say, logistics programming. Um, He's been practicing since 2010. Um, Paul has also um, gained a really big reputation for his work in past life regression as well. So we have loads of questions to ask Paul. As always, we always welcome the audience to put your questions in so we will get them answered as well. But what I'm going to do is welcome Paul on now and let's get this going. Good evening, Paul. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and thank you for asking me along tonight. I'm really looking forward to this. It is always great, um, you know, to talk to different people. But, you know, I've I've never had a hypnotherapist online before. You know, it is great because there's so many different avenues to the field that we look at. And and I think this is going to be great to how the paranormal can tie into hypnotherapy, past life regression and regression. Um, you know, so we will definitely get into that. What I want to do is just say a few hellos to people in the room already. So we have the boss man of Portal to the Paranormal in. So hey, Dan, Dan, hope you're well. Uh, Patricia, uh, thank you very much for joining. As always, Nick, I hope you guys are doing well. You and Abby are doing well. Uh, Colette, hey, how are you doing? Um, And again, as always, if you guys have any questions that you would like to throw at Paul, please do ask. Um, but I'm going to kick this off and say, like I said, you've been practicing since 2010 now. Um, but where did your journey originally start? Like, how did you get into the field? Because I know originally you were, you had your hands in like a radio, radio DJ as well. So where yeah. did you change for you? Well, okay. So the, the very first seed, I think, came from seeing hypnosis on TV. I used to love the program, which many of your viewers will recognize strange but true during that they did talk about hypnotic past life regressions but i also um i I just think i'm a bit loud actually so i'll also make sure that my mic well oops sorry about that Uh, (laughs) we were were just saying that in the background like when when you're starting something it's like the mic will go the picture will go but no it's absolutely fine yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah, uh, I think it was Paul McKenna to begin with, you know, when he actually looked like this chap on TV. Do you remember when Paul McKenna actually looked like yeah. this? So I was really interested in hypnosis from, from that stage. Uh, and I kind of forgot about it for a while, although for Christmas, I used to have certain things like um, sensational snooker. Uh, and those who play snooker with me will realize I haven't actually listened to that cassette for quite some time. I got into hypnosis during my exams because I was very nervous about taking exams, being dyslexic as well. Mm-hmm. So we were talking about that before we went yeah. we went live. Um, and I think that the first little seed was planted. Uh, I had got a book, Paul McKenna, Change Your Life in Seven Days. Uh, and that was really the first time I properly got to know about NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, as it's called. And Paul McKenna also known for his 
hypnotism, his hypnotherapy work. There was a CD at the back of it, which you used to listen to, and I used to find it very relaxing and enjoy that. I got into listening to that because I wanted to get into radio broadcasting and nightclub DJ. And although I had a little bit of success volunteering at some local radio stations, and I also had some sort of success in some small nightclubs, uh, I was held back from my fear of rejection. So Change Your Life in Seven Days was the first time that I started feeling, yeah, this is this is the way that I, I want to be, be going and feeling very confident about myself. Uh, and then my dad became ill with cancer and he started getting in listening to hypnotherapy CDs. And he also started um, a little bit of knowledge about NLP just from the Paul McKenna book that I was reading. And it really made a big difference in his life. Uh, now, he was quite ill, so he wasn't able to get out of bed. But there were little signs he was beginning to get stronger, but unfortunately it was a blood clot because of being in bed that he passed away from in the end. But I think he was always really happy, and I could see the strength that was beginning to come back in his life. And I thought, you know, this is what I really want to be doing with my life, with my with my career. I love doing the radio broadcasting. I love doing the nightclub DJing because I actually did some some nightclub work, but that was always just happiness for a night rather than something that could lead to happiness for the rest of their lifetime. So that's kind of how I got into it. About a year after my dad passed away, I signed up to an NLP course with my trainer, Kim Phillips, wonderful trainer, did um, then hypnotherapy with Raymond Roberts. There was various different stages, did stage hypnotism yeah. because I was just curious to know how it worked. It was not really a path I wanted to go down, but I was just really curious. And people always asking me about stage hypnotism. And I also took another um, uh, certificate in past life aggressions with Maria Wheatley, who's a master dowser and also a great teacher in past life aggressions. So that's my journey to uh, what I do now. And and what what's great about your journey is that you also face challenges that you overcome as well, because um, a lot of people go through life. And one thing that I think is very common for a lot of people they're they're scared about the risk of re rejection, you know. And as you're saying, being dyslexic as well, you know, some people use that as a barrier, you know. And it's just great that you've overcome that the way you did with the learning curve that you've gone. So I'll just say, well done to that. That's amazing to hear that journey that you've been on. I can Thank completely you. relate with suffering from dyslexia for myself. It feels like your mind's on high speed and it doesn't mean that you're not as intelligent as some people. It's just, it's trying to pluck out those words that are in your mind and just getting them down in a, in a way we may not get there straight away, but we get there eventually. And I find with topics of interest as well, where if it's something that I'm really interested in, I excel, like really excel, like I, like you do in this topic and it's just it, it it knocks your confidence sometimes when you do feel like you're tongue-tied or you're in the presence of someone really intelligent because it feels like that you're you're not worthy or you don't you don't feel like that you can challenge them as well as other people can but it does it's just a confidence issue isn't it absolutely and i would say that it's intelligence in another way i think sometimes yeah. when you're dyslexic you see a different path to your destination that somebody who wasn't dyslexic might not see and then you know as well you know I, I have got better but I still have a bit of dyslexia I do lives as well and sometimes I get people's names wrong uh, when I interviewed uh, Ken Gerhardt I remember saying Buffalo Creek is a bluff creek at one point so they slip out but I think whilst I've developed my confidence through the NLP the hypnosis work the hypnotherapy I think I don't mind so much now when people see that side of myself because I used to hide it away, but I think just own it. Particularly if I'm tired, I sometimes yeah. rumble words together. So I will say uh, something like I'll say that again in English or just throw some other joke in just to kind of make fun of it, lighten it and show people that I'm not so concerned as I used to be. Because I remember when <laughs> when I was at school, one of the worst, the worst times was reading out aloud. You know, I mean, the, the horrors that I would get, you know, from, from that and the whole day would be ruined. The weekend would be ruined sometimes. But now, you know, it's it's just part and parcel of me. And, you know, I like who I am and I'm pleased with the way I think differently to other people, but come up with quite creative ideas sometimes. I use the words layman, ter layman terms. Tell me in layman terms. And, and reading out loud, completely understand that. Embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. 
But, um, you know, with, with hypnotherapy and hypnosis, is there a difference between the two? Well, hypnosis is the way of putting people in or hypnosis is pulling people into uh, hyp hypnosis, trance, sometimes people call it, uh, being mesmerized, other people sometimes say. Um, but uh, there is a difference because hypnotherapy is actually the therapeutic side of it. You're still using okay. hypnosis, but the therapy comes from what you're doing with people to help them get from their stuck state to their desired state or take them into past lives sometimes as well. Wow. How do you start off with that then? Is it laying on a couch like you see in the movies and trance or look at this watch kind of thing? Um, you know, some people do use a watch still, it is uh, you know, and I think uh, one of the reasons why I tend to not use it is because I've actually got quite sensitive eyes. So I find staring at any objects, my eyes actually start to suffer quite a bit. Mm. So I think that they used to either stare at a watch, spinning discs are sometimes used by some hypnotherapists, stare at a spot on the wall. And I think that's where pe some people can't be hypnotized comes from because people that in the past that weren't very good because a lot of eye fixation techniques were used in the early days of hypnosis and people some people like myself didn't like it they don't work very well for me eye fixation hypnosis mm -hmm. so they would have been labeled as being resistant to hypnosis but as long as somebody is able to you know happily let go i think that's the main thing people have such a fear around hypnosis they've seen programs like the avengers great programs but where somebody's given <laughs> a code word at some point they then get off march off like a zombie and assassinate somebody or something like that but you know sometimes uh i mean i'm actually sat in the chair which i hypnotize people in and i like it because it's comfy when i'm doing live streams or chatting to people on skype i tend to tend to have them reclined when they come to see me at home but you can have people sat upright uh, you can have any, even hypnotise people whilst they're standing up. Sometimes you see the stage shows, they're all sat on very uncomfortable chairs, but they're still able to go into hypnosis. But I tend to find when somebody's coming for therapy, it feels more fitting for them to be led back in this recliner chair. In a relaxed state. And how is it that you, because essentially you're getting into the mind of the person, like opening up their mind. So is it like some way of psychic ability that is going on or... Is it a science? How, what, how would you describe how you're getting into the person's mind? Well, there's several different inductions that you can do. The most common one is the progressive relaxation technique. That tends to be mostly my go-to when people come to see me. But I do mix and match depending on the personality of the, the person. Sometimes people who can't really relax that well, you do a confusion induction to them to confuse the conscious mind to allow them to go into hypnosis but all hypnosis is self-hypnosis so I don't actually ever hypnotize anybody I help guide somebody into that state of hypnosis so what I'm doing when I'm seeing somebody go into hypnosis is just seeing those little subtle signs which you get more and more used to the longer yeah. you do this work and you start seeing that someone is beginning to relax. And then when you see them relax, you can throw in more suggestions to have them relaxed even deeper. So most people go into at least an alpha state because when you're, um, the normal waking consciousness is like the beta. There is gamma above that, but we won't worry about that for now. Beta, normal waking consciousness. Then you the cycle slow down a little bit more and then you go into the alpha state. So that's kind of meditation. Also, as well, when people are driving in the car, they, they, most people driving the car tend to be in like an alpha state. So they're driving in a light hypnosis, which is kind of worrying, but it's what's called automatic pilot. Mm. Deeper trance is kind of around theta. And then you have your delta right at the end, which is which is sleep. So you're just helping guide to people to that stage just before they fall asleep, but when they're not quite awake either. And in that state, they're more suggestible, but only to the suggestions that somebody's willing to take on board. You can't hypnotize people to do something which is against their will. Okay, cool. And, you know, another question relating to it is the state of the mind. So you, I'm sure you've come across different clients over your years of doing this. Um, and even with the regression and past life regression, do they have to be mentally fit for you to be able to do this? So if they've had like some kind of mental breakdown or Depression. a mental issue in the past, can that be dangerous for them to go into this venture with you? Um, I always get people to sign a form to begin with to say if they have any 
clinical depression, epilepsy or other psychological things they should be worried about, I always suggest that they speak to their doctor beforehand. Only one doctor's actually said to me, well, it's up to you, you know, to the client side beforehand. But most of them said, yes, it's absolutely fine. Most of the times the people that I deal with, it's kind of usual sort of depression and it can actually be very beneficial. But I like to get that proof that they're happy for me to go through beforehand. It is yeah. something that all hypnotherapists should do to cover yourself before taking part in a hypnosis or hypnotherapy session. Also as well, during the past life, if they've been through a credible amount of trauma, although I do healing work within the past life, you want to just be aware of that as well, because if they've really been through some terrible times, um, you, you, it might be something that they'll need to see somebody beforehand. But it's the conversation I always have with someone. If anybody is a little bit unsure, uh, I always speak to them beforehand and explain the whole process, get them to sign the form. But it's very, you, you, uh, there's nothing that actually is in hypnosis that is harmful. You've just got to be aware of what's happened to somebody in the past and just be a little bit aware of that when you're conducting a session. When we talk about past life, Paul, um, are we going down the reincarnation route? Is that is that what it it means basically so like you die and then boom you're back in a room straight into another baby living life again is that is that how it works in your mind uh well i always say i'm an explorer in this field and i think like when you go on a paranormal investigation sometimes what you get is actually generally a ghost communicating with you other times oh it's that draft in the corner so I think when you're with the paranormal field and when you're in the past life field, it can be that it is actually somebody who's reincarnated. It could potentially also be the theory of genetic memory or the other one as well, the cryptonesia, hidden memories that you might have been told at school, completely forgotten. And under hypnosis, you're able to remember them and create a story around it. Uh, sometimes people say it's also going to be like a complete metaphor for you to uh what's like dreams to help you out with this particular life now mm. the more i've done this the more kind of swayed i am to there could be something in this for some at least some of the regressions that i've done but when anybody comes to me i always say there's no way to prove or, well actually because it could be the genetic memory as well or it could be the cryptonesia but you know i, I won't put my belief on somebody else everybody yeah. who comes to me has a very personal belief about what it is. Some people do come there, they're slightly skeptical and just really interested. Some people are completely believers in it and I don't think it's my job to tell them what to believe. I just do the session, make sure that you don't lead it, saying that I'm very pleased with my sessions that I never do uh, because you can lead a client and allow the regression to go in a certain way like i will always just ask people to move on in time you could go back to say the 1300s and i've had people in the 1300s who's reached 70 80 years old but you, you wouldn't want to say in the session well of course the 1300s people didn't live very long back then when did you die because that's presupposing which can influence the person so i always make sure that i as best as i can i don't ever influence somebody in a hypnotic session also, I've been reading these uh, articles and watching YouTube videos and TikTok videos about children that have been have claimed that they have lived in a past life and saying names, street names um, from the ages of, of two to five, then yet forgotten after the age of seven. But then there's substantial evidence. I think there was a, a boy who claimed that he was a woman and he died in a fire and he, they went back to Ireland and then they got the names correct. I'm only giving examples. But have you ever come across anything like that or where I heard things like that? Well, I do hear questions. There used to be a program called The Ghost With Inside My Child, which I really like that program. It was really interesting talking about children with spontaneous past life claims. I also really like the work of the late, great Dr. Ian Stevenson. And you shared the video I said about some of his findings on your page, mm -hmm. which I was really grateful for. So thank you for that. But That's he the went round the, he went round the world investigating children with spontaneous past life claims. And these children, it's usually ends up being when they're talking about the age of three, might say things like, you know, you're, you're not my real mother. I want to go 
to my real mother. You know, before I came here, I lived in the mountains. Uh, and what I find interesting about these children is that they're not, that they're almost like adults talking when they're talking about these particular things. So Ian Stevenson went around the world investigating these children. And part of my talks, I talk about Dr. Ian Stevenson, who passed away in 2007. And quite often when I'm giving these talks, oh, my son used to say, um, one of my members saying that their son was looking out and could see kangaroos, you know, and, and seemed like they were describing a life in Australia. Uh, another person who used to work with their daughter used to say, do you remember when we both used to live uh, another area of Gloucester and used to go up the stairs with a candle to bed and it was Mrs. So-and-so's house or something. The trouble is, is I really wish when people had these, they'd either, they'd either write them down or now you've got mobile phones. You can record everything the children says because quite often some of these parents used to say, oh, that's very nice, thinking it was just their little make-believe, their fantasy. Then later on, they actually begin to think maybe there might have been something in what these children are saying, but they say something like, well, you know, unfortunately now those memories have faded and he doesn't remember it anymore. So if anybody's watching this right now and their children or they've got grandchildren that are talking about these interesting things, it might seem like it is a past life, you know, please write it down or record mm -hmm. it. Even if you don't want to share it with people, it'd be interesting for yourself later. And then maybe you might be able to do some research on it. Wow, that's amazing. Um, just to go over to the audience as well, uh, Lorna's asked a question. Do you find that people who easily uh, visualise, meditate, are hyp hypnotised more easily? Usually, because they're used to slowing their brainwaves down. So they do go into hypnosis more regularly. Not all the time, but most of the time, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, people that regularly do this go into hypnosis a lot quicker. Also as well, each time you put yourself either in a meditative state or hypnotic state, you go deeper into hypnosis. So sometimes people come back to me exploring the same life several times and you get more information about it then. Um, you can do sanking in hypnosis to bring them out of trance, put them back into trance, take them out of trance to make the uh, hypnosis even deeper so that's a technique i sometimes use as well but i tend to find that yeah they definitely make very good subjects mediums usually make good subjects people who regularly meditate make good subjects a few of them you ask you say close your eyes and you go oh they you're there already and then you think well a couple more deep ins won't won't hurt them so you just deepen a little bit more but you don't need a very long induction with those people do you feel that uh, past life progression could be related to deja vu. As an example, I feel that if I'm in somewhere, like I went to New York and I've never been to New York, but I could find my way about really easy. And I think that could be related to a lot of people that, that have been in the same similar situations. Do you think that that could be a thing? It could be. I think it's a good possibility. Uh, I have heard that sometimes with deja vu, it's like a miniature blackout, which might happen throughout our lives anyway, but literally the brain for a millisecond will just kind of switch off or its neural pathways or fire in a slightly unusual way. And that will give people the impression, hang on, I've been here before and it's what you remembered before you had that little kind of neural pathway firing or you had that little miniature blackout. But to say that there is... It is on the Paradox Club Facebook page. Some of the viewers may remember us seeing that. It's also on my channel, Steve Mulligan. He had lots of deja vu in Llandidno in North Wales. Uh, he used to love going there as a kid. He used to stay just outside of Llandidno. And was, they'd used to just go in there for like day trips. But when he was there, he felt like he was home. And uh, his mum would say oh, we got to go to this place and steve said oh we just cut through there and she'd always say well how did you know that in the regression i conducted on him he was somebody called sydney sutcliffe who was a flight lieutenant who was shot down in the first world war and he, a lot of very good information came out about his father abraham being uh, a stage entertainer uh, lots of information about that lots of information about his home life which we did actually contact the uh, North Wales Post because we wanted to see if there was any members of the family that 
were happy to because it was saying you'd have to if this family member's still alive you'd have to treat it with a lot of kindness and respect but just to see whether anything that he said being talked down the lines any photographs information was right about the family because what we could find was very accurate scarily accurate but there's just those slight little things like what he used to do in the family home that the children used to entertain with glove puppets and a little stage those sorts of things if you could find that information that would be just the extra cherry on the cake the proof that there is something truly interesting and paranormal going on with at least some of the, the regressions yeah. i'll call it pigeon radar as well yeah mm. pigeon radar, that's what you were calling it. <laughs> um, with what you do okay is there a, a do you have a set routine that for you to prepare yourself when you're getting ready to meet with a client and do either the hypnotherapy um the regression or past life regression you know what do you do to prepare yourself to be ready for that Usually 30 minutes of just relaxing, uh, sometimes with a coffee, uh, sometimes with some water, and just taking that little bit of time out. Uh, I don't really do anything because a lot of the work I know is, is doing the healing process afterwards if the client needs it. Uh, also as well, um, I've been taught how to deal with ab reactions. So sometimes when somebody's in the past life, suddenly you get a surge of the emotions uh charlene uh if anybody's seen that one on my channel but it's also uh on uh charlene's channel um paranormal hauntings i think that's that's their channel sorry charlene if i've got it slightly wrong uh but she was a viking and uh, she was a female viking uh and she was on board the ship the boat and there was a bad storm and her son in her regression that she had was swept overboard and that I could tell the tears were just beginning to come in her voice was shaking and I knew a strong ag reaction was going to come if I didn't do something soon so I took her back to a time within that lifetime when she was completely and utterly safe completely utterly fine then told her that she would only experience what emotion she felt comfortable experiencing as she went through to the to the death experience uh, and also as well it seemed like it was going to be a death experience but I didn't say is this where you die because again that would have influenced the way the past life aggression was going but what is interesting is Charlene is and she's said several times she's not a very emotional person she finds it uh, she doesn't cry much at all uh, she doesn't like really wear a heart on the sleeve she's just kind of she's just happy friendly but she's not someone who's a very emotional person but here she was in the regression really getting very upset about mm. a son which she didn't have in this lifetime but potentially in this the past lifetime so it's uh it's it's really interesting and i think have i asked you a question have i gone off on the tangent there no 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 no, 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 no. you've answered <laughs> the, the the question um you know, which is great. Do you want to? Have you ever had to get the fire extinguisher ready in case someone went got really aggressive under hypnosis? Has um, been I, I haven't, but then you can bring <laughs> them out. Also, as well, when somebody is in hypnosis, you can awaken yourself at any point. If there's oh, something right. you really, really don't like, you can bring yourself out of hypnosis. <laughs> the nearest I've had to somebody uh, was during a live that I, I I was doing uh, and they yeah they did get a little bit um, annoyed with me with the questions that I was asking at the time uh, and but I, I didn't feel at any point they were actually going to attack me if I did I would have, I would have brought them out of the hypnosis <laughs> very very quickly <laughs> <laughs> but when, when you're saying about the hypnosis and like when they're doing the, like the past life regression for example they're going back in time to a totally different are they aware when they come out of it are they aware of everything that they've discussed with you do they know or is it something that you have to document and say well this is the session and this is what you were telling me yeah so i always throw in the suggestions after the hypnosis that you remember everything about this session with crystal clear clarity because quite often there's amnesia with hypnosis yeah. it's just a natural thing that people have when they come out of hypnosis 
little bit like when you have a dream and you say, oh, what a brilliant dream that was. And then when you try and remember it, once you fully woke it, you, you, it's very sketchy, you can't remember it. That tends to happen quite a lot in hypnosis. And when I've got somebody for hypnotherapy, depending on the client, I'll actually add that in because it's important that the work that I do for them whilst in hypnosis is for their subconscious mind only. If they're then trying to piece every little bit together of what you've just told them, they're basically unpicking what was meant for the subconscious mind only. But by adding the suggestions in, that you remember everything with crystal clear clarity, uh, people do remember it. But I also like to record because there is something called paranesia, which then people, everybody, so many people do it, ask somebody about a crime scene, they all have different viewpoints of it. So I always make sure that I put in uh, a recording, mic them up if they're with me, so they can hear what they say word for word. And paranesia is crediting more evidence to what they've experienced in the regression is actually there. Or in anything else in life might happen in the paranormal when somebody sees a ghost, you know, they get excited. And people don't do it on purpose, but people can't help but add to the story little missing gaps and it yeah. might not be exactly what has happened. No, no, I get it. In a relax, relaxed state, I had a, I had a friend who was telling me about astro projection and how he uh, had to relax his body to be able to come out of his body. Do you feel? Have you ever experienced astro projection with, or think it's an actual uh, thing? Yeah, I think it is. If somebody wants to experiment, because I have done unusual things with hypnosis uh barry guy exploring the chapel of unrest with his uh with his eyes closed what it would have been like in 1825 uh was uh an interesting experience and something that i i i did so i'm always interested in exploring and as long again they've signed the form they're happy to do it it's saying that i'd be happy to do <laughs> i've heard people's stories but it's not saying i've actually done on people but yeah, maybe that's a, a next experiment that I can do. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, what I'm going to do is just throw it over to the audience. There's some questions that have come in that I want to jump to. I think you've answered Abby's question already. Do you record your past life sessions? You've just yes. said you do, um, which is great. Um, Maria's asked, how do you offer these regressions? I'd love a recap. Okay. So, so it's through hypnotherapy. Um, although it's hypnosis, get people into a past life, but and make sure that it can be a therapeutic session as well, offering them healing at the end of it. So that's using some of the tools and techniques that I have learnt as a hypnotherapist to help ease the upset they may have had in a past life. Um, so I take people into a nice, deep, relaxed state called hypnosis. I always, mm. when people come to see me one-to-one, -one, do a, a, a slower, relaxed induction so it's enjoyable for people. Uh, there is such a thing that you can do a shock induction for people because there's many different ways you can do inductions. That's that's often done by stage hypnotists and stage hypnotists. I don't do that whilst people are in the chair because I think the last thing I want to do is say have a shock to go into the hypnosis. And also I want it to be a relaxing experience and as enjoyable as possible. And even if they've had some trauma in that past life, for it to be an enjoyable experience. And I've not had somebody who's ever come out of hypnosis and said, I really didn't enjoy that. Everybody said, oh, that was amazing. I really, really like that once they've gone through the healing process if they need it. Not everybody does need it. So as the hypnosis to put people into the hypnosis hip, hypnosis and having the past life, then there's the therapeutic work that I always add in that because I'm a hypnotherapist. Yeah. Um, you, you're saying about stage hypnotherapy, hip Gnosis or hypno what they do on stage and a lot of the times they, they make people do stupid things do, do you personally feel it sort of degrades the work that you do because you're doing it for you know you're you're trying to help people but then when you see people doing it on stage it's like entertainment and it sort of changes that you know they're making people do stupid things they're making them look stupid in my opinion but i just want to get your thoughts how do you feel based on well you do it on a professional capacity to yeah, my, my trainer, Raymond Roberts, was a stage hypnotist and also a hypnotherapist. So he did both. Mm. Uh, he was very, very good. I think as well with stage hypnotism, the people that put up their hand to go on stage are the kind of people that would 
stick a pair of underpants over their trousers and dance <laughs> and sit at, at, at a party. They're incredibly extrovert people. They're happy to um, look stupid in front of other people and other people yeah. are happy to have a good laugh at them doing crazy, stupid things. If somebody was very shy and very retiring, uh, they wouldn't stick up their hand. Occasionally you hear people say, oh, they were so shy and retiring, I couldn't believe him whilst he was up on stage doing all those things. Well, he did volunteer to go up on stage. So I think yeah. there might have been a little bit of him that just wanted to, or her, that just really wanted to just do all those things that had the excuse when they were hypnosis to maybe do some of the things that they felt that they, they didn't want to do. I don't do stage hypnotism because it, it's, it's not really something that I want to do. But, you know, I, I, I know that Raymond teaches it very well, very ethically. Uh, also, as well, when you do have somebody up on stage, uh, he's very respectful to what might have happened in their past as well. Uh, something like you're a rock star playing rock, you know, and, and you, you like the music comes on, you start strumming the guitar. Yeah. Is, is you know, nobody's going to get, well, once in a blue moon, maybe, but nobody's going to get an emotion, a reaction to that. But you never know. I've seen some hypnotists before where this person has, like, touched you somewhere you know and you know i've seen it before on 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 youtube where somebody completely screamed at that you've got no idea what has actually happened to that person in the past to add that suggestion it might suddenly bring back a, a terrible trauma that they may have buried and hidden so be very careful with it stage hypnosis but if you've got a good stage hypnotist you'll be fine yeah. it can be a lot of fun as well yeah 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 i think there's a difference of opinion like everyone has an opinion on certain things and you know, it was just something that I was thinking. And and can it go wrong? Like, like you're doing a session. Is there a risk that something can go wrong? And how do you control that? Mind is a powerful thing, after all. Mm. Well, I've done this since 2010, and I've not had a single person that has had a bad experience from it. If somebody does get an ab reaction, uh, when I do the sessions that you see, online even though i offer healing because it, whatever you're doing it's important that you offer healing but it mm. is done for i want to say much entertainment but for interest for people when i have somebody on a one-to-one -one session particularly if they're using past lives to heal something sometimes experience a little bit of that emotion is helpful for a release people may have experienced after having like a good cry think oh, I needed to get that out of the way so sometimes it's good you just got to watch to see how much somebody's going into that is it a bit of tears or is it a full-blown trauma but what you do you, some some hypnotherapists will beforehand set up a safe space which is something I sometimes do if somebody really really you know is it looks like they, they could do with it but most of the time all you have to do is take them back to a either neutral time or happy time make them really relive that and then give the suggestions afterwards that they only experience what emotions they want to. But, you know, I'm always very careful how I do it. But, yeah, I've never had anybody that's ever had a negative experience from, from that. And I've done quite a few people now. So there's a no shallow hallow needs a girl going on. Oh, right. Yes, yes, I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trust you, Tony you. Robbins is the, uh, yeah, is, is the, is the hypnotist hypnotherapist in that who is actually yeah. a, a famous sort of life coach he's done an lp uh so yeah i, I do like that film it's great it is, it is, it is a great film, yeah. a great film. and you know not only that we're, we're talking about people looking into past stuff that's happened to them but you also help people with like different phobias like central phobias anxiety Spider. you yeah. know when you're helping them to try and get rid of those like feelings, the the phobia. Is it like you're rewiring their brain with the way they think about certain things? How does that part of it work? Yeah, like smoking. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, each client that comes to me, I it, like Milton Erickson. I, I really like Milton Erickson's work. And uh, he was a, a, a famous hypnotist who passed away in the early 80s. In fact, he had polio twice. And the first one, he helped get himself over it towards the end of his life he was in a wheelchair was dressed in a lot of purple because that's the only color he could really see and was basically breathing with half a diaphragm but still an absolutely amazing hypnotherapist and uh yeah he yeah. would use so what was the question again so <laughs> so so um no that's fine don't worry so what i was asking is 
when you get someone that's coming in with a phobia or um, yes, they have anxiety, it. are you rewiring their brain or how does that part of it work? Yes. So uh, when I when I, I, I do this, the, 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 the fast phobia technique and Milton Axon, that's the reason why I was going down his his route. I, I don't know what I'm going to particularly do for a client when I see them. And in NLP, when they were looking into all the different people with the different therapies, because also I went into a bit of selling as well. Uh, NLP, but that's not the side of things that I do. These, it was Robert Diltz was there, um, uh, Richard Bandler was there, and um, uh, other people that were developing the NLP at that time were, were there. Um, they would ask him these questions, and he would just keep answering them back, I don't know, because it was very intuitive the way he worked. I like to think that I work very intuitive as well. Uh, but so I never have a one size fits all so if somebody's coming for phobias i don't say i'm going to do this technique if somebody's coming for smoking i'm going to say i'm not going to do this particular technique you know i'll explore with them and together we'll find a way forward to get them from that stuck state desired state but basically there's something called very effective the fast phobia technique which is an nlp technique and you're viewing yourself on a cinema screen going reversing the image then going black and white forward reversing the image adding comedy into what's happening particularly if uh if it's like a fear of spiders find your saint they find very very funny it could be clowns now some people don't find clowns funny at all but if they find clowns funny you stick in a clown in there maybe give the spider a, a clown's face and a a little hat on and sing in the heartbreak hotel really badly or something and what you're trying to do <laughs> whilst you're in programming and implanting these suggestions in is start to see the client laugh and then when you start to see the client laugh once they've been thinking what terrifies them you know you'll begin to break apart that phobia that that trauma sometimes you have towards values uh, so say somebody uh, wants to quit smoking because they um, their towards value would be they want to save money and they want to be able to spend X amount or it could be away from value, which means they don't want to get unwell from the smoking. So you then work towards what their values are and why they want to quit smoking. And and that's with all sorts of different things as well. Yeah, and how, how, what is the weirdest like, like case that you would say, like someone's had a phobia? Like I've got a phobia that I've had for years and my phobia is balloons. Like, I don't know what it is, but as soon as I'm near a balloon or someone's got it in their hand, I, I start freaking out. It's, it's like a you kitten know, or you know, a little chick or something cute and fluffy. A little chick. I don't <laughs> but yeah, what, what's the weirdest one? That, have you ever had one that is sort of in your head thinking, well, that's, this is a weird one? Uh, well, it was. They, they're usually quite normal for me. I think I've had a fear of frogs once, which wasn't too bad. You know, It's, it's not something that you're going to come across too often frogs you know um so that's probably for me the weirdest one but uh, the strangest one that i've heard of uh it was blimey going back now the extra ransom program in the afternoon remember put it on after coming back from school they had somebody who was completely terrified of crumpets and wow. somebody oh, actually okay. had uh, I think it's to do with the little holes or something in them yeah. and it was actually taken seriously by the police because uh, somebody had literally got packets and packets of crumpets and threw them all over a driveway. I mean, literally, they were just all over the driveway and she saw them, couldn't drive into a drive and just froze. And she had to get, she actually called the police. I think that the neighbours and people helped clear it away, but that she actually spoke to police because it was not just one or two crumpets it was they must have spent a fortune doing this you know so it was actually really thought seriously as as a hate yeah. crime and i know that the police took it very seriously but that's probably the most unusual i know I've, I've heard of people that have fearful of buttons but for me it's the usual sorts of things arachnophobia uh fear of uh tight spaces claustrophobia uh, agoraphobia fear of being out so it's, it's the usual uh phobias that people tend to phone me for Wow. And with, with that said, you know, what about if someone is sceptical about what you do, but they, they have a phobia, for example, let's throw that out there, but they're sceptical. Does that make it hard for you to be able to help them if they it, don't believe in what you do? 
Yeah, fortunately, though, that doesn't tend to happen because they, they, the people that are skeptical about it won't actually phone me up. Um, yeah. Yeah, the ones which don't work very well, and sometimes I will actually say to a potential client, look, you might as well just roll up your money and drop it down the drain. That's that's what's going to, because if they want to quit smoking and they're going because their girlfriend, their boyfriend is a uh, husband, wife, badgering them to quit smoking. They don't want to do it themselves. They're not going to do it. And I've met those sorts of people. In my early days, I'll take anybody on. Now I make sure that they want to have their, their goal uh, because I have met people, particularly if I'm like, somewhere a social gathering or say having a haircut and somebody's talking to me and they sort of say oh i saw a hypnotherapist once didn't work and you you can tell but they said you're pleased you're you're genuinely really pleased that this hasn't worked for you because i think that they've been badgered it into somebody else it's very difficult you get parents phoning me up because their their child is going down a a bad path i always like to make sure that I speak to whoever it is, first of all, um, usually it's sort of teenagers, you know, because sometimes they'll just agree to it to get mum or dad off their back, but they're not, yeah. their heart isn't in it. So again, I'll say to the parent, look, you know, if, if they're not into it, again, you might as well roll up your money and drop it down the drain. No, definitely. Yeah. And as we said, a lot of this, we're, we're talking about getting into someone's mind. You know, um, a lot of people say that we don't use a big percentage of our brain. But then there's other talks that we actually use more. We just use it at different times. W would you agree with that? Or, you know, yes, how much I, of our brain do we actually use? 10%. I, I, yeah, I mean, there is that sort of 10% you only use. But uh, the route that I've gone down now is that we use all the brain, but at different times. That's kind of where the science is going. So... Science is always moving. They might change their mind yeah. in several years' time, but that's the route that I believe. That, that we are using a lot of our brain. Yeah. It's, just, we, it's like just different parts of our brain does different things. Would that be right? And that's when we yes. use it? Yes, that's it. In fact, if anybody wants to change a habit and it's only a small uh, habit, uh, there's something called Kaizen, small, gradual, uh, incremental change. And that's introducing change at a small enough level that uh, the person doesn't take on it as being changed. Because the brain, I use the word hard, it, the brain isn't hardwired. They used to think it was hardwired in the past. It's not. It's it's always adaptable. It's, it's always moving. And that's how you can change habits or, or, or break habits. But we do certain things because it's easier for us, because we're conscious only of between five and nine bits of information at any one time coming in and to make life as easy as possible you go on autopilot but if you enter that change in such a small enough level then it can lead to quite a, a big change uh, I'm always cautious because when any client comes to me I always say to them what remains with us will remain with us there are certain clients that are happy for me to talk about their their situation mm. uh and and I, I did slightly change the story because that was the agreement with the the client um but th for example there was a, a, an artist who was just procrastinating my task for them was just to do a couple of strokes on the canvas nothing else just a couple of strokes and then if they felt like doing more they had to leave it because I wanted them to start wanting more. And then they were able to sort of start it. They were able then to start and enjoy doing their art because they started that little seed of a habit starts. And once you start a seed of a habit, it's easier to continue. Um, talking about small changes, a, a lot of things, particularly in New Year, that people want you for is for health. And one study that was done, they gave an office block. It was in America several floors up so you would need to take the lift to get there because literally you'd be probably walking for about half a day to get up to these skyscrapers one half of the office was given unlimited uh gym access for free for a year the other half were told to just get off the floor below and walk one flight of steps up to their office by the end of the year although the people who were told just to walk the flight of steps up to 
where their office was, all those people that just did the small change started to add more healthy routines. They were walking a few steps that they're doing walking around the block. Whereas those that had unlimited gym access after a while just couldn't be bothered to go and were less healthy than the ones that were just told to that small change. Oh, that's great. Well, you must have had some clients that have had some emotional damage and try to use hypnotism for healing process. Um, can it be, I mean, you're only human, can it be emotionally draining for you sometimes? Yes, it can. Um, because some people, there's a lot of resistance. You have to enter their model of the world as well. Uh, my client might have a different model of the world. I mean, it's nothing that is a dreadful model of the world, but they might have slightly different beliefs to me. So you have to enter their model of the world, understand where they're coming from. And um, I, I'm, I'm able to distance myself enough, obviously they care, so I'm not blubbing along with the person, but sometimes it can be quite, quite draining. So I make sure that I set up enough breaks between clients, um, you know, putting people into hypnosis, particularly if I do hypnosis throughout the day. I remember I used to do these lives, uh, sorry, these psychic fairs where I did past life questions, not very much money, 30, 30 minutes each. And mm. I did about 10 in one day and I was through because I was going, because when you go, when you do hypnosis or hypnotherapy, you're actually traveling into that hypnosis with your clients as Milton Erickson used to say, my voice will go with you. So you're going down into those lower frequency brain waves and then back up again, down again, and it, it gets very draining. So I tend to only allow about three clients in one day because more than that, I'd, I'd be through. Most of the time it's about two, but three is the absolute maximum that I'll see in one day because you're, you're just through afterwards. No, definitely. Have you ever been hypnotised, Paul? I have, yes. So when I did my training, that was uh, one of the things that we did. The NLP, Kim Phillips, she taught a lot of the Ericksonian hypnosis um and then after that i went and did raymond roberts which was the hypnotherapy then the stage hypnosis and during that you were going into hypnosis out of hypnosis he had a slightly different approach it was uh dave Elman. i tend to do a, a combination of of both and it depends on the client which kind of route that i go down with the, the hypnosis and then i did past life aggression so again we were all going into hypnosis so i've done it quite a bit and also as well i'll go through stage i do a lot of self-hypnosis in the morning uh but i also enjoy listening to sometimes mine sometimes other people's hypnosis because i think it's good to walk your talk and constantly improve yourself it's like uh you know you, you don't ever not clean your teeth if you want to mm -hmm. avoid tooth decay, you don't think, well, yeah. I don't feel like doing it today. So I do, even if it's a very revised form of some tools and techniques, I always make sure I walk my talk because I want to be the best version of myself that's going to help clients. What was the most exhilarating past progression you've ever done? Like, wow, moment. Uh, I think uh, lots of them really. Definitely Steve Mulligan, who I mentioned because lots was proved to be right after the session. Stella from Red Radical Cartoons, that was a really good one of hers. Again, I'm talking about ones that people are happy for me to talk about. She went to, uh, she was in a convent in Utrecht, I think that's the way you, you, you pronounce it. Um, she was sort of saying everybody was self-sufficient because they were poor. She had to go to the to the convent the way she described, the way she was looking. And it was saying in the Netherlands that she, because that's where it was based, uh, she never particularly was taught about in school. She never had any particular interest in it. When she was there, she was saying about not having much food. Uh, there was actually a famine during that time. So that was, that was kind of a, a, a well moment. Some of the um, emotions that people go through as well, because what you see on my YouTube channel is only a very small, it's, it's basically the tip of the iceberg of all the clients mm. that I've seen. Um, and some of them come back to me after and say, I've seen this, this and this. But also as well, sometimes it's the emotion that you get in, in people's faces, you know, uh, getting upset, really entering into the life that they had, changing their, their voice, their mannerisms. And a lot of these people as well, which makes it more compelling for me, the only people that get to see it 
will be then when they watch back their recording that I do for them because I video record it, mic them up. Or, you know, so it's just literally them and me. They're the only people that get to see it. And it seems very odd for me that because people say, oh, they like to make it up. Literally, they don't want anybody else to see it. So to go through all that to sort of pay me money to make up things just doesn't make sense to me. So some of the clients that I see are incredibly compelling with what, what they come up with. Um, and, and also as well, I would often find that people aren't like another version of them. It's not like if I was back in medieval times, I would be like this. Sometimes they're completely and utterly different people. I've had gay people who've been in same sex relationships when they've done the past life, they've been married. And they say the feeling that they have of being married and really loving this wife that they've had, this female, uh, is is very overwhelming, very strong. And I've also had people that have been completely and utterly you know, straight in this life. But when they've gone through to a past life in the time when it was illegal, you know, the really unrequited love and fancying yeah. someone and this kind of shame that they felt because of society at that time. So these are kind of sort of things that are very interesting because they're not themselves yeah. when they go into these hypnotic past life regression states um there's experiences that i've had in like when i'm falling asleep i've had just like something in my ear talking to me in a different language which i would have thought would be in paranormal or a relative in my ear talking to me and also when i woke up when I was just coming to I felt like I, I saw a woman like they call it old hag syndrome oh, right. oh what's the other one? Oh, when you're um oh when you're when you feel like you can't move in bed it's yes. all it's it all it's all connected to that kind of psychosis isn't it or yeah so that is when you're, you're trapped in in bed is you've you've woken up consciously before your body's woken up um people are temporarily i mean not totally paralyzed but literally they have some sort of paralysis they're temporary just out because otherwise people would be acting out their dreams um occasionally it doesn't always work <laughs> a family member have to find out exactly who it was but somebody was dreaming they were trying to catch a mouse or a rat and were <laughs> tugging on the back of their wife's ponytail in bed. Um, so we, so with those sorts of things, I mean, quite often that's where you get like the, the demon, the incubus, succubus come from that experience yeah. because people then start panicking as they can't move mm. and start visualizing all sorts of things. But like I say, because it is that 99% of the time, maybe there's something paranormal going on one percent of the time as well so i never dismiss anything and i think yeah. with with the way i i treat things is to be a skeptic in the old-fashioned greek sense of the word now it means a naysayer but in the old-fashioned greek sense it meant one that keeps on inquiring and don't make a a, a decision about things uh the, the trouble is sometimes i think and I, i'm not labeling anybody here but I think there's so many people out there that have a theory, you know, some scientists, you know, that basically will reject anything that doesn't fit in with their theory. Fit in with science, I yeah. get that. And, and talking about the paranormal, you know, does paranormal and hypno and hypnotherapy, past life regression and what you do, is there a time where you can, like, for example, you've gone on paranormal investigations um, and you did this a fair bit but i think now you concentrate more on what you're doing now as your profession yes. but could you walk into a, a paranormal investigation and use hypnosis to try and connect with a spirit for example yes most definitely and that's something i want to do more of in fact uh when i did an event in saint Breville's castle organized by jane harris and whilst i was there i had a group of people in hypnosis uh and then got them to go back to the place when we connecting with the spirits um i i mean i would have to check out so it was right but they uh, surprised how many people actually came up with the name alice you know nobody talked about it beforehand but that was a name which came up quite a bit during the hypnosis so i have i have used it for that uh i'm potentially going to use it in the future for uh something that i'm organizing 
but it's not come to fruition yet. So uh, I will I will let people know if, if that does by either giving you a, an update on it or, or putting it on my my channels, my pages when when that that comes comes ahead. That is a great yeah. idea. And if you want to come yeah. on one of our ghost hunts and try that out, you're very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, Sounds good. Were you, were you Sarah as the guinea pig for that one? Then? Okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, I've tried. But would, would that mean doing it differently? So from a client coming in with, you know, um, you know, looking at past experiences and things like do you have to go into it in a different way when you're doing a I'm you going into a paranormal into investigation because are yeah, you as, yeah like sarah said are yeah. you essentially inviting the spirit into someone's body possession uh well they they say i mean i tend to not go for that the spirit will jump into their body uh, um but i will i will do things so vibrationally because a lot of people say everything is vibration so i will get the person to tap into that vibration um so that the spirit can talk to them and they're picking up what's what's being said i would probably not want to just go down the total possession route although there is something uh which i trained in and have dealt with a bit uh which is it's parts therapy but also as well some people saying they have like attachments um and it's it's important that you treat it as an attachment and are just very open about it. Also as well, not just assume somebody wants to get rid of this because maybe it's not an attachment. Maybe it's actually a part of oneself that they need that. I've got loads of books where somebody's just got rid of what they thought was an attachment. It ended up being yeah. a part of that person. And until they reinstated that part, they felt there was something missing. They were kind of a bit depressed they felt like life wasn't quite right and it's because they just got rid of this part sometimes we just need to talk to other part we mentioned smoking earlier sometimes people have two parts one that is absolutely put off by smoking and think it's a horrible thing they wish they didn't have to do it another part of them likes it because it's the way of unwinding it's connecting with other people when they go to a pub they share cigarettes outside now but that's something that uh, is so you've got to make sure you've both parts understand each other and then you find the way forward from speak to those different parts so again sometimes it could be attachment sometimes it's just uh, a, a different part of somebody but just go into that open-minded don't lead somebody and uh think of the best outcome for the client rather than what you think is best for the client mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Paul, make it, sure that they sign that waiver if you go down that set <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but, to, to be fair we, we got claire she says she's up for it as well so yeah, she's okay. with you. thank you claire, claire. You're doing well. <laughs> it, it would just be great because how you're trying in a different way you know, this is very different to what we're, you know, people use psychic mediums. Mm. We've seen psychic mediums do their bit, you know, equipment, you know, different things. But this is, this would be great to see it's someone go into a hypnotic state and then yeah. seeing what they recall from a location that you're in. Similar and similar scrying, don't we, when we ask the spirit to overshadow the face of the body with the red light, or we can do it in water as well, can't you? So it's so very similar. Has, has your thoughts changed though? Like, from when you, because when you originally started doing paranormal investigations, this was before you went into the line of the hypnotherapy. Now you've done this. Is your thoughts different about the paranormal? Or are you skeptical? Uh, well, it's kind of sort of remained the same, but I have more knowledge now. I think uh, I've become a little more. Um, look at all the different avenues uh at one point i remember being hugely excited by orbs and you know i, I think there is a space for orbs you do get people who've completely dismissed orbs now i think mm. there's still uh room to look at them uh particularly i remember the first one i went into we got an orb on two separate different cameras now if it's just dust that shouldn't happen so that's that's quite mm. good when i started doing the past life aggression it started off just being interested then I started thinking maybe it's people's subconscious mind and then more stuff started to come out I think actually maybe there's really something in this um you know with, with just the compelling evidence that comes through so I think as well it's not saying you can just capture and stick in a Faraday cage and as we were saying you go to a haunted location uh you feel a cold draft 
it could be spirit it could also be a draft coming in from somewhere mm -hmm. and i think as well is as i said before a lot of the experience i've had some very compelling ones some are more compelling than others some have weakness in their case others don't have the weakness in their case so it goes from being what could be like metaphor or fantasy for the person to be how on earth do they pull this one out of the bag uh, yeah. and i think that what you have to do in this field is complete going back seeing it time and time again and not coming to a conclusion because i find the work i think what has definitely happened i've got more questions answers than when i i started more and more questions come up which is great because i like a mystery no no oh, definitely wow. um you know it, it's been great having you on tonight and just learning a little bit about you we would love to you know hopefully bring you back on in the future to carry on because there's so much more we could ask um but Thank what you. i want to do is just finish off is um can you tell the viewers where they can find you if they want to have a chat with you about a range and maybe doing a past life progression or any kind of work that you do how can they reach you yes thank you so you can go to my website um www www.paulgoddardnlp so that's for neuro linguistic programming because i set up the website before i did hypnosis so i could just put nlp there so nlp so that's for neuro linguistic programming so november lima papa co uk if you put paul goddard hypnotherapy paul goddard nlp i will come up on on google uh i've got my uh facebook pages so i've got paul goddard past life regressions i've got paul goddard nlp and hypnotherapy i've got youtube channel paul goddard nlp and hypnotherapy and i've also got past life regressions with paul goddard uh my email address is paul at paul goddard nlp.co.uk um, and i've also got the phone number attached into my website as well but people can contact me you know I, I i'm happy to send if they send me a friend request but if you're going to do that just please say that you see me on this because it gets very confusing sometimes with who's um uh, going to actually want to be interested in your work or you know have something like mine in common or that you've liked because 20 of your friends also have them on the friend list the next thing they know they're trying to sort of sell you some sort of scam or something like that so just put give me a little message beforehand i will see it uh you can message me on my private facebook page uh, on my business facebook page as well so connect in any way where you want to if you if you google me or put in paul with gloucester because that's where i'm based i will come up that's absolutely brilliant. And just lastly, Paul, I'd like to compliment you, on, compliment you on having a fabulous head of hair. That is an impressive barnet you have there. You Thank could, you very you much. Could, you could have do a Just for Men advert or even like thousands of balding men all over the world watching this is very jealous right now. Yeah, if you were, if anyone wants to have a hair advert, friends. you know, contact me through my website. <laughs> <laughs> but no, honestly, it's been absolutely great to, to get to know you a little bit more and you know, um, and also just one more. You also have a podcast that you do on a Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday yes. Uh, yeah, I used to do that. Uh, some some lovely friends of mine, Lindsay and John, uh, they've got a, a, a program called Explore the Afterlife. Uh, I ended up being so busy with other work. It was it was getting difficult to fit it all in. But you can still see live interviews with me on the panel. because I've also got another YouTube channel uh button for punishment adding youtube channels uh <laughs> paul goddard paranormal so on that i've interviewed some some very interesting Great people guess, yeah. i've got some uh panel places that i've i've gone to and and filmed and, and have to edit uh i try and do it as best as i can because uh the most important thing is is the clients that come through to me if it's not the nlp so if it's not the past life regression work because that's easy i record it I usually just top and tail it so i take off the induction so not seeing 15 minutes and getting more and more sleepy i'll get straight to the to the regression part of things but I'll also do the standard hypnotherapy with people with that i record their hypnosis session live on a mp3 recorder mic up so it's a nicer sound then afterwards i listen to it through and just tidy it up I send them through a list of exercises to do because it's important to do some exercise. I don't bombard them with stuff and also add a way forward. So when I've got my clients, I really make sure I get them done because they, they've paid me for it. So as and when I can, I will add more to the, the paranormal page. And those that have subscribed, thank you for your patience.
Brilliant. Fantastic. What I have done, and I will do, is I've put some of the links to Paul on the description, but there is some other links that, as you've just mentioned, I will add that as well. So please do head over to um, Paul's YouTube channel as well. He's got some great bits on there, um, all sorts of things, interviews, um, talks that Paul does, and they're really interesting. So if it is something that you want to find out more about, definitely ho head over to Paul's YouTube it's, channel and connect with him. It, it's well worth the watch. It's been a real honour, Paul. But it's been great. It's been a learning experience as well. Thank you ever so much. Oh, thank but you yeah. so much. I've really loved being on here and thank you for asking me. It's no, well, time. hopefully we'll definitely have you back in the future. You know, yeah, I'd love to. I've, still, I've got a list of questions that I can carry on asking, but I know <laughs> you're travelling tomorrow as well, aren't you? So Yes, my, my trainer, uh, Maria Wheatley, the one who trained me in past life regression, she's a master dowser. She has a book launch in Avebury tomorrow. I've shared it out on my, my personal Facebook page, um, so I want to be there because great lady. Um, I'm going to meet lots of interesting people, so heading down there early tomorrow to, to be there and enjoy Avebury and the Stone Circles as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, we'll let you get on. Again, Paul, it's been great to meet you. We Thank definitely you. will keep in touch. Um, and enjoy your weekend away then. Um, but we'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, catch up with you soon. You take care now. So take care, Paul. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Um, what an absolute great guest. Um, Paul, very, you know, intelligent. Yeah. You know, the it just shows like even with, you know, very informative, but even with challenges that he went through yeah you know concern it just shows we all have those feelings and there is a way through it so it was absolutely yeah. great just to find out about paul um just for everyone um with portal to the paranormal uh on sunday we are going to be doing a, a live which we're going to be talking about events that we have coming up and we also are going to be announcing a competition um that everyone could be part of um, so please do check out our Facebook, YouTube. It will all go on there tomorrow afternoon. Um, the time, I think, will be about 7 o'clock in the evening because I know people will be going back to work on the Monday. Um, so, yeah, so definitely join us on Sunday um, as we go through the events for the rest of the year. Um, we have a brand new location for our Halloween event this year. Um, so we'll be talking about that. And again, we've got the competition. Um, but we just want to thank everyone as normal. You know, thank you for everyone that joins us on every podcast that we do. Uh, the questions, the support that you give the page is absolutely amazing. Um, but we will be back soon with some more guests. And what I love about our ghost hunts and our events, it's not just about the hunt, is it? It's about the location meeting and meeting people and the history of the place as well. They're amazing. Yeah, so it will definitely... Um, check us out on sunday we'll have a good old chat about um what's going on with us but just for now i just want to say thank you again for everyone enjoy the rest of your weekend and we will be back soon for another port to the paranormal podcast but for now good night or good day wherever you are and now. we'll speak to you soon bye bye